Um, okay, so um, I, I think this session doesn't end with me, and it ends with the story. So I'm just gonna just just before I start, I'm gonna say uh, thanks to Sonic X for inviting me and having me here, and um, thanks to the crew, the last few days has been helping make this possible, and thanks a lot to the speakers who you know it's a privilege to be in your all your presentations. So okay. Five stories on heat. Cái đất nước Việt Nam mình có cái đặc biệt là có người thứ nhất lãnh đạo đất nước là Bác Hồ. Bác Hồ lại là bạn của Picasso. Bác Hồ là bạn của một cái họa sĩ nổi tiếng của Đảng Cộng sản Ý. Tên là gì thì bác quên mất rồi. Mà ông là họa sĩ rất giỏi của Ý, rất là hiện đại. Bác Hồ là một cái họa sĩ mà sang Trung Quốc thì bác đã biết là những cái nhân vật như là Tê Bạch Thạch. Như là nhà họa sĩ như là như là như là cụ cụ gì nhỉ cụ gì mà học ở bên pháp về đây cụ cụ bên pháp về cụ vẽ 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 ngựa rất giỏi cụ tôi biết không bác hồ tất cả những nhân vật nghệ thuật bác hồ không lạ lùng gì cả bác hồ không lạ lùng picasso mất thì nhà nước ta có gửi điện chia buồn thì tôi mới biết là như thế là Picasso là là một người đảng viên cộng sản và là bạn Hồ Chí Minh từ hồi những năm bạn còn ở Pháp. Light and Belief is a 2012 film made by Vietnamese artist Ding Kiu Lay, looking at the many artists that have played a role during the Vietnam War against America, that itself had had succeeded the first Indochina War of Independence against the French. Together. They plunged Vietnam into a succession of wars that lasted 30 years. In the film, the uncle Ho that Le Lam and Phan On so affectionately refers to is none other than the North Vietnam communist revolutionary Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was born Nguyen Sinh Kung, but was also known as Nguyen Thak Thung, Nguyen Ai Quoc, Bak Ho, Uncle Ho or simply Buck, uncle, that sits amongst the 50 to 200 pseudonyms he had used over a lifetime. But for this story, I'll simply refer to him as Ho. Phan On is a retired army colonel who also served as the director of the army museum. I met him four years ago on a research trip to Ho Chi Minh City, formerly known as Saigon. Just like Fun, it was less a surprise being reminded that Picasso had been a member of the French Communist Party, which Ho had co-founded, than that Ho and Picasso were in fact friends that socialized within the same circles in France. Predictably, we know that Picasso was, of course, a communist, but then also hung out with the future revolutionary leader of a Southeast Asian nation of millions. The latter mere footnotes of history that seemed to have dropped completely off page. Ho was himself a man of the arts, who as Fan pointed out, also painted, drew, and wrote poetry. Like his contemporary Sukarno, the first president of independent Indonesia and originator of his, na of his country's national art collection, both men were seen as revolutionaries. And it is this relationship with the arts these men had 
which I often feel elevates them to such exalted status. It wasn't nearly enough to be the military leader that freed over 100 million people from colonial rule. They were as well enlightened. Individuals whose very own culturedness also brought the intellectual heft which symbolically marked the political and spiritual independence of their newly sovereign nation that truly marked them out as men worthy of the term revolutionary. Ho and Sukarno were the last amongst a group of leaders from an era where being cultured was a, was a currency. Alongside their European counterparts from the early half of the century, they form a rogue gallery of characters whose affinities with the arts often made one gloss over their many transgressions. Colonel Fan's practice as a painter has outlasted his time as a soldier. Unlike artists elsewhere, his painting career and many of his peers had begun during his time in the military, deep in the guerrilla wars fought in the tropical rainforests. Although some were already artists, in the rainforest, young men and women were trained to become soldiers, but also introduced to the fine art of sketching and painting. These were soldiers forged in the very heat of battles, physical ones, but also the more metaphoric, ideological, and cultural ones. They had to be woke before they became the establishment. Now compared to the French and Americans, traditional cinematic powerhouses of their time, photographic and cinematographic equipment was scarce for the North Vietnam side, which hampered their means to document the struggle. But they weren't about to let that get in their way of writing the narratives, during or after the war was over. To circumvent that, they doubled down on the emphasis Ho had placed upon art throughout the revolution. Having the artist-soldier become both participants and chroniclers of the war themselves. A tradition that began with the, against the French and then against the Americans. As Fun would say, our artists were unlike artists from other countries who sit in their studios to paint. In the aftermath of bombing raids and battles, through sketches and paintings, the soldiers would render the scenes before them into images of war. Commandos crawling through barbed wire in the thick of battle. Special forces bashing through the jungle terrain. Flaming helicopters hurtling through the air, and many more were etched into documents of war. All of, all of which, self-evidently, bore the subjectivities of the artists that made them. Fortunately, battles weren't constant during the war. There were often periods of relative quiet during which the artist drew inspiration from the softer, more mundane side of things. Day-to-day -day life amidst the sweltering heat of the rainforest and their many interactions with the villagers nearby, whom they would wow with their draughtsmanship and painterly skills in return for their support. Perhaps it was all a ploy to entice the villagers or the simple purpose of recreation for the soldiers themselves, in a situation where resources and options were few, they did the most artist thing they could possibly have done. Putting together exhibitions of their own artworks for themselves amidst the dense, sweltering terrain of the tropical rainforest and invited the villagers as the only audience they had. As he was sketching out this illustration, Colonel Fun explained that hidden under the thick, continuous canopy of the rainforest were the soldiers' quarters that measured 8 by 16 meters in size. These structures were erected waist deep into the jungle ground as they connected to the network of trenches that linked the entire compound. These, exhibi these exhibitions would begin in the quarters and have sketches and paintings con continue along the walls of the trenches. These were multifunctional spaces for movement, evasion, concealment, and exhibition. The exhibitions continued onto the surface, where the artworks would hang from lines that, that ran from tree to tree. To further protect the artworks from rain, the artist took care to place them within transparent plastic sleeves. Through a mixture of sheer boredom and ingenuity, these exhibitions extended to the mangroves with artworks hanging off lines alongside plank walkways 
on, to, on which soldiers traverse the exhibitions. Joined by, a, join, joined by an audience of crocodiles swimming below them. Alas, war waits for no one, exhibition or not. And just as his, his luck would have it, at the opening of Fun's very first exhibition, him and his comrades will find themselves scampering around for shelter from an enemy bomb raid. A thoroughly sweat-inducing experience had the swollen air of the tropics not sufficed before. Fine couldn't remember how long the bombing lasted, only that the opening had resumed after. There was once a village that laid along the coastal waters of an island called Tomasek. It was an island that was later called Singapura, and again later in 1819, Singapore. It was a small fishing village without, where, without precedence, on one stormy day when the coastal waters stirred and the sea level rose, outlets swapped fishers that lunged themselves against the fishermen and villagers along the shore. Some were killed and many more injured. These attacks happened again and again, tormenting the villagers. When finally, one day, the Raja sent his men into the stormy waters to fend off the menace. But they fared no better. Many men were lost and many more injured as the water turned, water turned a crimson red. With no solution in sight, it cast a shroud of fear over the village. Time passed. One day, a young boy who till today remains unnamed went to the Raja. He asked the Raja to send his men on a bright sunny day to cut down as many banana trees as they could manage and had the Raja's men lodge the banana tree trunks into the water to form a long-running wall across the shoreline. They waited for the storm to arrive and duly came the swordfishers. But as the swordfishers leapt out of the water, their spear-like bill impaled into the tough banana tree trunks that left them stranded in place. The storm passed, and the Raja's men slayed the many swordfishers, tinting the water red with revenge. The villagers rejoiced, and the young boy became the village hero. Popular, intelligent, and youthful, the Raja grew jealous of him. Fearful, he sent his men at night to the hill that the young boy lived the top of. They entered his heart, and in the quiet of the night, plunged their chris into the boy's throat and made a hasty descent. Down the hill and through the night, the boy's blood flowed, sipping into the soil, colouring the hill red. It was from then on that the hill came to be known as Bukimera, and after English arrival, Red Hill. The tropics is a region of the globe that for at least one day a year finds the sun directly above it. In that, the tropics is defined by astronomy through the tilt of the earth in relation to the sun. The tropics is however, consequently, most commonly, commonly characterized by its hot and humid climate that results in the biodiversity teeming with flora and fauna. In recent years, Despite the lack of any significant changes in Earth's orbit around the Sun, it's been observed that the tropics has, been, has expanded climatically, with a larger area of Earth that's now hot and humid. As to why that is the case, it is perhaps easier for you to arrive upon your own assumptions than science to provide a consensus. So I shall leave matters of speculation to you rather than add to them. I had a premise for a film where, in a far-flung far future, we'll, ap we'll arrive upon the time whereby the Netherlands had become tropical. Not tropical in a Dutch and Teal's colon colonized kind of way, but the tropics has expanded to the Netherlands manner. With that premise, I needed to conceive of what such a Netherlands and, and its inhabitants would be like before I could plot the scenarios of my film. When I was in Singapore, I filmed an interview with my mum. I asked her to imagine what winter is like without having ever experiencing one herself. For in the tropics, there are no winters. 
She told me that her image of winter is conjured by what she had seen from films, photographs, and paintings. This led me to a museum in Netherlands to look for artworks depicting winter. While in the museum and with the film in mind, it dawned on me that in the future tropics, these iconic images of people buried thick in their, win in their winter wear, skating upon frozen canals amidst scenes of snow-covered landscapes of yesteryear, were as well future images of loss. And how alienating these paintings by Dutch masters from this colder age of Dutch history might seem to the Dutch populace of a tropical future that still struggles to connect with its national past. Perhaps by then, artworks from former Dutch colonies in the tropics would be sequestered from the ethnographic museums they've long been consigned to and finally regain their rightful status as artworks. Finding their place within art museums in a Dutch climate that now resembles its former tropical colonies. Maybe by then, heat would no longer be a dirty word in the museums. I spent the next few hours thinking about, about the film while shooting quietly in the different galleries of the museum. While leaving the camera to capture these scenes of winter frozen in image, I began to feel a chill build up in my body from staying idle. It wasn't that the wintry images had somehow gotten to my being, but the effectiveness of the museum's cool and dry climate control system that was being felt upon my body. A recommended 20 degrees Celsius with 50% room humidity that combined sits just below the ideal room temperature for a tropical body to be comfortable in. In keeping the hot and humid tropic-like qualities out of the museum, could one also see the term climate control as a metaphor for the exclusion of tropical artworks from Western art museums. It dawned on me that were the temperate climate to disappear from the Netherlands, they would live on within the confines of the art museum. Museums have always been repositories for art, but in the Netherlands that would become tropical, museums would also be repositories for a lost temperate climate. Of course, much of a future tropical Netherlands could just as well be underwater. Between the glacier tender sea, spoon in time span land straddling walls before or after people came to be in a logic straddling imagination of migration west east. The most popular theory of human migration to the Americas postulate that sometime between 16,000 to 12,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, temperatures rose and glaciers thought to open up a land bridge spanning barrier, an area stretching from northeastern Russia to the western coast of Alaska that offered passage across oceanic distances before rising sea levels swallowed it up again. Amongst the myths that have been passed down, it is thought that in northeastern Arizona, the Hopi tribe's tale recounting the entrance into the fourth world had been born of the millennia spanning migration. What cold, cold condition in mass was as I've forgotten what tenses this passage out of bin. There'd be mammals and woolly saber tigers having made the journey prior remembered history with only fossil records and carbon data time-stepping precedents predating human feats. My logic might be jumbled up, but I desperately avoid clarity for insuity is a tricky proclivity, so we may as well get out of it in the name of mutual benefit. Uh... Glacial gone the bridge appeared that was so vast no one knew its infrastructure covered by snow and ice that much later come asunder and sunken as the heat and water climb and claim those past icy ridges. Hopi dispute gather one after before a self-same tradition together came to left in herd tribes over climate plowed land. People would depart people with seeds on them in distance as earth spread open as butter upon bread. Hopi mood. Mm. 
They said it's a trip where third world birth the fourth world world born through feet crossing one oh 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 kilometers or six to zero miles of land if imperial's your thing. This passage has a ring to it spanning Russia, Alaska. Some latter day has chrism bearing a soul near to the pole world 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 learn. Then as there is a therefore now that we deem to repeat to as sea level rise to leave only islands of name I rather not speak for the thought of separation myself same other who like well history treat as ellipsis. I speak rhythmically though not rhythmically in hopes that sound are sounds that through a sense of relatives could mean the cycle is a breakening. In 1955, Ho Kok Ho, the late Singapore architect, artist, and president of the Singapore Art Society, went to the UK, Europe, and United States for a six-month sojourn. He was of Chinese descent, but just like his Vietnamese namesake Ho Chi Minh, also painted, drew, and wrote poetry. And for this story, I will also refer to him as Ho. Ho was a renowned architect by his 30s. He was the son of Ho Kuang Yu, who himself was a well-known architect. Ho was also the quintessential Chinese literati, an aspirational status held within Chinese traditions. Yet having received his architectural education in Australia was also what one would refer to as a westernized individual. Suddenly, his close ties with the British colonial governor in pre-independence Singapore and colonial circles only furthered such an impression. He was the son of the equator of the tropics, which meant that before such a thing was commonplace, he was the very confluence of east, west, and south. It was during this trip that he produced the majority of sketches and paintings that was later collected within this very book. Mixed along with his travels through Malaya and Australia were Trafalgar Square, the Moulin Rouge, London Bridge, and New York. A laundry list of major western destinations, but also various quaint rural landscapes across the UK. Going through the images produced, I couldn't help but feel that Ho had been living out the highly romanticized life of a Western artist. One that was and remains idealized to this day by many artists from former colonies. Looking through the book with his son, Kake, who pointed to a sketch of New York dated August 1955, told me that that was when his eldest brother was born. It didn't strike me as something particularly meaningful then, but it later dawned on me that he must have planned the trip knowing that he missed the birth of his first child, which as someone Chinese was pretty cray. This only added to the gravity such a trip had entailed. Perhaps he saw it as the last window of opportunity to assume the role of the artist, which only reiterated to the filmmaker and me how much of a desire he must have had in playing out this idolized character. I asked Kake if his father ever went back to Europe, and he said yes, but never again for so long. I asked myself, why was it that he had to go? For me to understand that, I had to travel a little back in time, to the small fishing village that was Singapore where the Western notion of art first arrived alongside colonialism. Fast forward to 1963. Leading up to Singapore's independence from the English, the Singapore Art Society that Ho co-founded spearheads the change at the charge towards artistic emancipation, where amongst the key tenets of the society were the fusion of East and West, an adherence to scientific knowledge, and the infusion of tropical flavors. This served as the society's roadmap towards a tropical modern, which in the context of 1950s Singapore, 
was the oxymoron equivalent to the Museum of Modern Museum of Contemporary Art. Again, I had to ask, why was that so? And we cut even further back in time, tracing the historical conception of the tropics back to Europe's early interaction with its former colonies. Where the tropics first encountered by Europeans was often, de was often described as a place so hot and humid that one would be incapable of thought. Coupled with its wild, exuberant and untamed jungles, conjured over, over time a shroud of unintellig unintelligibility over the climate and its inhabitants. But that's not who we are, Europe must have taught. And thus began the ideas that centuries later would become the modern. All of which leads us back to the proverbial elephant within the Singapore Art Society. How does one conceive of the tropical modern without first unraveling the colonial quagmire that is the tropics? Was this a conundrum that stood in whole such anxiety to at last seek out recognition from within the West? All this, despite his success locally, the tropical creature that was he could only seek to elevate his mind within the cool and dry temperate of the West. Curator legend has it that on Ho's trip to the UK, he brought along with him over 100 pieces of artworks by him and six other Singaporean artists. It was, however, only upon arrival in the heart of empire that he sought out a venue to hold the exhibition, which by some minor miracle came to be held within the fabled halls of the former Imperial Institute. Titled Paintings by Singapore Artists, it was to be the very first exhibition of Singapore art in Europe. The smooth operator that he was, Ho had the then Duchess of Kent in attendance as the opening's guest of honour. Ho walked the Duchess through the show, showcasing all kinds of paintings from occidental styles to traditional Chinese scroll work, elucidating his guests with details of the many experimentation him and his peers had made in combining the painterly techniques of Chinese ink and Western oils. Going as far as to perform a demonstration of Chinese ink painting himself, a display of showmanship that might have bordered upon the exotic had the Duchess not been just as affable a guest, who very gamely surprised everyone in picking up the brush and having a go at it herself. The interplay between royal and the distant subject of empire did not go unnoticed. Words of his success resounded through the British press. So impressed by Ho was the Sunday Standard, whom they reported as knowledgeable and interesting, who behaved without that trace of harsh obsequiousness which enters into so many relationships with the royal family. And in the Sunday Times, nothing could be more lovely or arresting than a tranquil Malay village brought to life by the bold traces of a palette knife or a tempo scene stuck and richly read in style of the more ultra-moderns, or yet Eastern, fi Eastern fi figures, vivid, bizarre, and near Picasso-like in surrealism. They say sound travels faster at higher temperatures, 330 meters per second at zero degrees Celsius, 343 at room temperature, and 358 within the tropics. Yet word of Singapore art took all of 136 years to finally arrive in empire. Having traveled over 7,000 miles just to be heard, Ho boldly declared the exhibition a new vista for Singapore artists. It was, it was a feat so impressive that it echoed the very might of coloniality. So finally, I would tell everyone that Ho had made the journey all because artists from the perif peripheries, from the tropics, had long felt the anxiety to seek recognition from the West. Yet only have them tell me again and again. 
that's you. Thank you.